Welcome to Blackstone Intelligence. I'm Jake Morfonios. In this episode, we're going to explore the intriguing rise of the Knights Templar and discuss some of the things that have made them not only famous, but infamous. Bernard de Fontaine, who is now head of a Cistercian monastery in Clairvaux, had two things going for him. For one, he was intimately connected to a powerful cabal of nobles who stood at the heads of several influential European families. These were families to whom Emperor Charlemagne had entrusted control over territories throughout the entire Holy Roman Empire. These men claimed to be descended from the Jewish priests and the leaders who had fled Jerusalem before the Roman military sacked the city in 70 AD. Like Bernard, many of these men infiltrated the hierarchy of the Catholic Church to try to manipulate the affairs of the church from within. Now, the second advantage that Bernard had was that he was not only brimming with energy and intelligence, but he was also ruthlessly cunning as well. Bernard personally founded 68 Cistercian abbeys with his own monastery in Clairvaux as his central headquarters. Well, one of these abbeys was founded in 1113 with the specific purpose of protecting what Bernard called a great secret. And as his network of monasteries expanded, Bernard had at his disposal a veritable army of monks. Because these monks were white instead of the traditional darker and black robes, they were sometimes called the white monks. Well, in February of 1117, several of the aforementioned noblemen met with Bernard at one of his churches, and among the eight attendees, there was Hughes of Champagne and a man named Hughes de Payen. This group of men, some of whom had previously been knighted, collaborated together to form a new order of warrior monks known as the Poor Militia of Christ. Bernard nominated Hughes de Payen to be the Grand Master of this new order. The following year, after Bernard pronounced a, a solemn blessing on the entire party, the group departed for Jerusalem, and upon arrival, these men were met with the approval of King Baldwin II. King Baldwin gave them a home on the Temple Mount itself, the exact place where the ancient temple had stood. Now, at this time in history, Jerusalem was under the control of Christians, but that was a fairly recent development. The Temple Mount, known as Harem Esh Sharif by the Muslims, had been under the control of the Muslims for hundreds of years. In fact, Muslims had completed the Al-Aqsa Mosque on that very location by 705 AD. It wasn't until the end of the First Crusade in 1099 that the Holy Roman Empire had taken control of Jerusalem. In fact, the poor militia of Christ was actually living at the Al-Aqsa Mosque on Temple Mount. Well, the men changed the name of their order to the poor fellow soldiers of Jesus Christ, and King Baldwin officially recognized them as the knighthood of the Temple of Solomon. This is the origin of the name of the Knights Templar, or the Knights of the Temple. But the fact is, these men were part of a conspiracy. Each of them were members of the tightly knit Rex Deus families. They were related by blood or marriage, most often by both. The first Grand Master of the Order, Hughes de Payen, was the cousin of both Bernard de Fontaine and Hughes de Champagne. But look, because it was believed that he was a descendant of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, Payen was often called Hughes the Moor. These temple knights were also related to the Patriarch of Jerusalem at that time. The Patriarch granted the order their first insignia, which was the Cross of Lorraine. And in later years, the order adopted the more no well-known cross that you see, the Croix Pate. Well, these bold insignias identified their order to others. The Templars followed the pattern of the Cistercian monks by wearing white clothing. And the publicly stated purpose, you might call it a cover story of these Knights Templar, was that they were there to protect Christian pilgrims from bandits as the pilgrims traveled to Jerusalem. But the truth is that what most of these men spent their 
time doing, the first nine years of their time in Jerusalem, was they were excavating the Temple Mount, hunting for the hidden treasures left by their alleged ancestors. And this is confirmed by modern archaeologists who covered an 80-foot deep shaft that led below the ground level, level of the Temple Mount. And they discovered a network of tunnels that the Templars had dug out and these tunnels were full of artifacts dated to the period of the Templars, including Templar swords and crosses. Archaeologists have wondered how these medieval knights knew where to dig. It's not that easy to figure out. And historians wonder how these men were granted permission by the local king to conduct the excavation to begin with. Well, the Rex Dave's families have presented their own answer to these questions claiming that for over a thousand years, the knowledge of what was buried and where it was buried had been passed down by oral tradition throughout the family and that King Baldwin himself was an active participant in these secret plans to find the ancient treasures. We can't say for sure what the Templars actually uncovered. Some traditions say that the men found the famous Ark of the Covenant, which had been hidden beneath the temple before the Babylonian invasion of ancient Judah. Other traditions say that they found a vast number of ancient scrolls with all kinds of mystic teachings, from sacred geometry to the esoteric teachings of the Egyptian mystery schools. These traditions are not without merit. Copper scrolls from Qumran, were unearthed in modern times, which make reference to many hidden temple treasures that were hidden prior to the destruction of the temple by the Romans. And what we do know is that something that these men discovered made them very, very wealthy. Now, here's where the story really begins to get intriguing. As previously mentioned, Bernard de Fontaine and his associates had managed to position Bernard at the highest levels in the Catholic Church, including his service as the principal advisor to the Pope. Bernard used his influence with the Pope to persuade the Holy Father to formally recognize the Knights Templar Order. Bernard himself wrote a special religious decree regarding the order, which Pope Innocent II gave his blessing to. This 1139 AD papal bull was called Omni Datum Optimum, which freed the Knights Templar from the authority of clergy, from the authority of kings, and even of emperors. They were responsible only to the Pope himself. Now, this greatly increased the power of the Knights throughout the lands. Grand Master Hughes and his Companions traveled throughout Europe, including Britain, convincing kings to gift to their order vast tracts of lands. The Knights Templar quickly came to have control over castles, estates, wineries, over entire villages and towns, which they rented out to tenants for money. And they obtained their own fleet of ships and they transported everything from wine to wool to be sold throughout Europe. This pseudo-religious order of Rex Deus families became unspeakably powerful, bursting at the seams with riches and backed up by the support of the Pope himself and the Knight's own private military, the first large-scale professional standing army in Europe since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. The Knights Templar used their powers for one primary purpose, and that was, of course, to amass breathtaking wealth. From the Papal Bull Edict in 1139 to the formal end of the order 175 years later in 1314, the Knights Templar accomplished their wealth-building scheme the exact same way that today's powerful cabal makes their fortunes, through unscrupulous bank lending and through warfare. Up until this time, it was very difficult to make money through long-distance trade because goods passing through these various lands were charged heavy, heavy tolls by the local barons. And beyond that, the trade routes were infested with bandits. But with the Templars gaining both lands and political powers all throughout these territories, as well as having their own political force, overland trade became a very lucrative business once again. And to help develop this long-distance trade system, the Templars needed more money to build infrastructure. 
So, just like today's central bankers, the Templars discovered that the easiest way to get money is to just make it up out of thin air and demand that everyone else accept it as having worth. In the beginning, the Templars came up with a system to allegedly to help travelers who didn't dare carry large amounts of money with them as they did their pilgrimages. Well, this system was basically a copy of the Eastern Sufi Muslim system known as the note of hand. The note of hand was basically, it was similar to a bank check. The way the Templars used it, a person who uh, needed money would go to the local Templar banker and deposit his hard money. And in return, the treasury would issue the depositor a coded voucher which he could take to other Templar te treasuries and other locations that he traveled to, to redeem and get money. And this was basically a medieval version of Western Union. But the Templars weren't providing the service out of the generosity of their hearts. They did it because they could take these money deposits and loan them out at interest to others. This money lending was called usury. They took other people's money, they loaned it out to nobles and to kings, and they collected large sums of interest. This practice also gave them great power over those to whom they lent the money. Even kings knew that if they didn't make their interest payments to the Templars, the knights could simply dispatch their armed forces to take what was owed to them by force. For example, after the Knights Templars helped Queen Matilda to secure the kingship of England for her husband, Stephen, during a civil war. She made sure to richly reward the Templars with a wealthy manor called the Cressing Temple Site. Matilda knew to pay her debts to the Templars. And by the way, Matilda was the first cousin of Jerusalem's King Baldwin II, who helped the Templars in the Holy Land. I'm telling you. The rich and powerful people of medieval times were almost all connected by blood or by marriage, something that we see among today's powerful banking families as well. You may remember my series on the Rothschilds and how the patriarch of the family, Meyer Amschel, left instructions in his will to his five sons for his posterity to keep wealth in the family by only intermarrying with other family members. When we look at the perilous situation that our world is in right now because of the greedy lending practices by these unscrupulous bankers, it's not hard to empathize with the peoples of medieval Europe who were also subjugated by the cutthroat bankers of their day, who of course were the Knights Templar. And just as the modern day Rothschild central banking cabal foments wars and finances both sides of the conflict to make ungodly amounts of money for themselves, the Knights Templar did the exact same thing. In fact, it was the Templars who financed much of the later Christian Crusades. With their powerful military, the Knights Templar launched two offensives, one against the Moorish Muslims in Spain and the other to try to retake the Holy Land, which had since fallen back into the hands of of the Islamic Caliphate. And just as modern history shows us that geopolitical wars are good for the military industrial complex and their government and banking conspirators, such was the case with the kings, the merchants, and the militaries during the Crusades. The wars dragged on and they dragged on, and it seemed that the point of the wars was simply to be able to remain at war at least so long as the wars generated windfall profits. During these years of warfare, the Knights Templar fought in many crusades. Perhaps their fiercest opponent was a 12th century Kurdish Muslim from Iraq named Saladin. Saladin founded the Ayyubid dynasty and he ruled over Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Hejaz, and Yemen. Saladin led the Muslim re uh, resistance against some of Europeans, uh, the European Crusades, and he is the leader to eventually recapture Palestine from the Crusaders. On my mother's side of the family, one of my family lines are the Burrs. As I did my family research, going through the family history, I found that I had several men in my direct line who were knights who had actually fought against Saladin's forces during the Crusades. My 23rd grandfather was a Norman knight named Baldwin de Burr. 
The Burrs were nobles from a line of Vikings who fought alongside William the Conqueror to help him win the throne of England in 1066. But among my ancestors who fought in the Crusades, one of the more notable men was Sir Richard de Burr. Sir Richard wasn't just a Templar knight. He was actually one of the grandmasters of the Knights Templar. He came to power after his predecessor, Grandmaster Armand de Perigord, was killed during the bloody Battle of La Forbi in Palestine. In that battle, over 5,000 crusaders were killed by the Muslims. Only 33 knights survived. Sir Richard was one of them. And he led the order for about two years until another grandmaster was chosen to take his place. Well, I don't want to get too bogged down in the Crusades, so I'll simply add that during the 200 years of battles, each side had victories and each side has lo had losses. But in the end, Palestine was back in the control of the Islamic Caliphate. Now, during these centuries, the Knights Templar were also heavily involved in massive building projects throughout Europe. This is the period in which beautiful churches and castles and Gothic cathedrals cathedrals were springing up all around the continent. And it was during this era that medieval craftmason guilds were formed, those that were building these structures. These guilds formed brotherhoods and shared certain moral traditions within their groups. They shared secrets. One of the craftmason guilds was known as the Children of Solomon, and the Templars formed a special relationship with the group. And soon, the two would combine and from their union, a new secret mystery school would be born, one which we know today as the Freemasons. In our next episode, we are going to delve into that relationship, as well as discuss the infamous sagas of the Holy Grail that originated with Rex Deus. Was Jesus married to Ma Mary Magdalene? Did they have a child together? And has that bloodline been preserved throughout time by a secret society? We'll discuss that and much more in our next episode. For Blackstone Intelligence, I'm Jake Morfonios. Guys, if you appreciate this kind of information, if you value the work that I do, if you're the kind of person who would leave a tip on the table for a waitress, I'd ask that you do the same for me. YouTube demonetizes most of my work, so any income that I derive comes directly from viewer support. You can go to patreon.com slash endtimesnewsreport or paypal.me slash endtimesnewsreport. You can also send a payment directly to me at Jake Morfonios, P.O. Box 1333, Kernersville, North Carolina, 27285. Thank you guys so much for supporting my work.